Greetings and welcome to our Clinician and Patient Education Series, or CAPES. This series is being made possible by an educational grant from Pfizer and represents a collaboration between four different organizations, all dedicated to improving outcomes in spondyloarthritis and psoriasis. This includes Spartan, Grappa, the Spondyl uh, Spondylitis Association of America, and the National Psoriasis Foundation. The title of our first module is Juvenile Spondyloarthritis and Juvenile Psoriatic Arthritis. My name is Judy Smith. I am a pediatric rheumatologist here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Our agenda is as follows. So after these introductions, uh, we will hear from Wendy Olster, Asad Khan, and he will be accompanied by his mom, Amina Hamid. They will share some of their experiences uh, being diagnosed and treated as children. And then after that, we will have a overview of juvenile spondyloarthritis from our clinician expert, Dr. Hema Srinivasalu. After her talk, we will open it up to uh, audience questions. Please type in your questions to the chat function in your video player. It'll look like two bubbles. And then we will finally uh, close this module with some announcements. So without further ado, I give you Wendy, Asad, and Amina. Hi, I'm Wendy Olster, a PhD student at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. I had my first symptoms when I was 14 years old and was diagnosed with juvenile psoriatic arthritis about two years later. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Asad Khan. I'm a junior in high school and I live in New Jersey. I had symptoms around the age of two and was diagnosed with juvenile spondyloarthritis at the age, when, at the age of nine. Hi, I'm Amina Hamid. I'm Asad's mom. I'm an educator and homeschooling mom of three. I have been by Asad's side since the beginning of his journey with ankylosing spondylitis and learning as I go through his experience with his symptoms, diagnosis, challenges thus far. So Asad, you were diagnosed at a very young age. What was your disease history and diagnosis like? Well, when I was around two years old, um, my mom noticed that I was limping when I walked. The limping, the limping would come and go. Around four, I stopped walking suddenly due to pain in my knee. Doctors uh, ended up finding fluid in my knee, so I was given a steroid injection to help calm things down. And then the pain had gone away until I was around nine years old, and then it came back even stronger than before. We went to many specialists, but it took a very long time to figure out what was going on, and then Finally, we went to a rheumatologist and we got tested. I was diagnosed with juvenile spondyloarthritis right after that. It was certainly a challenging time not knowing what was causing us its symptoms since they started so early in life. Once he was diagnosed, we felt relief at least knowing what was going on for so long and could finally look into paths for treatment. So Wendy, how was your uh, juvenile uh, psoriatic arthritis finally recognized? So for me, it also took a very long time to figure out what was going on. It started when I was 14 years old and I began having a lot of pain in my hips and my neck. I saw a pediatrician and multiple orthopedists, but none of them could really figure out what was going on. They even told me that I was too young to have a type of arthritis. And after more than two years of visiting hospitals, I finally visited a rheumatologist who could diagnose me with juvenile psoriatic arthritis as the joint cartilage of my hip was broken down due to all the flares. For me, it was also a major relief, just like you, to finally get the confirmation of my diagnosis. So uh, how was your treatment journey like? So after my diagnosis, I was put on an anti-TNF agent. I remember the first time we had to do the injection, it took over 40 minutes because we were just not ready and felt very scary. So from making sure we were inserting the needle into my thigh correctly, injecting it, and then it, uh, keeping the needle in my leg for 15 to 20 seconds so that all the medicine was in my leg. And then we would have to take the needle out. It felt like my leg was burning the entire time the needle was in my leg and the medication was going in. But after a while, uh, I learned how to deal with the pain. 
since I had to administer the injection every other week. And soon I switched over to a pen. And so we started using that instead of the injection and it made a world of a difference to me. Um, it's easier because I don't have to do any of the work and it also definitely hurts a lot less. And I also had methotrexate, methotrexate added two years later as well. Uh, so they responded well to the medication, thankfully, and has been continuing with the same treatment. Um, he's now able to keep up with his peers and play sports, et cetera. I'm very happy you responded well to the medication. My treatment journey was a bit different as I tried a lot of different treatment options before I had the right one. I started with NSRE days and steroid injections, but they only helped short term. I also tried a lot of different types of anti-TNF drugs, but I either developed antibodies or had a lot of side effects. And it took me years to try all these options. Luckily, I am now treated with an IL-17 inhibitor, which works great. So looking back at your experience, what would be the final message you would like to share? So for, for people who are uh, newly diagnosed, the disease and treatment may seem very daunting, and, but there are a number of medications that have helped many patients. And in my case, the treatment has been effect effective for the last seven years. And I'm hopeful that with continued research in this field, there will be advancements, many more advancements and one day cure. I agree. In the beginning, it feels like a lot, and it's important to know that you're not alone in what you're experiencing. It's always okay to ask for help, and we're lucky that although sometimes it can take a long time to fight, find the right one, there are a lot of treatment options available. Thank you for allowing us to share our stories. Hello, um, I'm Hema Srinivaslu. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist at Children's National Hospital at Washington, D.C., um, I'm going to be talking about um, juvenile spondyloarthritis. The objectives of today's talk are to recognize juvenile spondyloarthritis as a disease spectrum, recognize the genetic risk factors involved, identify symptoms and appearance of disease and how these may change over time, and recognize various treatments, including role of diet and exercise. So the prototypic disease for juvenile spondyloarthritis is ankylosing spondylitis. And um, the, the origin of uh, the word is from Greek words, where it basically means bamboo spine. And as you can see in this uh, figure where they tracked the spine um, in this gentleman over several decades, um, you see how the spine got um, its curvature. And when you look at uh, plain radiographs, you would see that the spine uh, consists of these individual vertebral bones um, are supposed to be separate. But in this disease, they fuse together with these bony fusions and it looks um, and gives the appearance of a bamboo spine. Um, but not all patients go on to develop ankylosing spondylitis. In fact, um, the spondyloarthritis is considered as a spectrum of diseases with ankylosing spondylitis being at the extreme end of the spectrum. And there are several other disease um, phenotype that um, contribute to this um, disease uh, process, which include undifferentiated spondyloarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, acute anterior uveitis, arthritis with um, inflammatory bowel disease and also juvenile spondyloarthritis. Now, coming to juvenile spondyloarthritis, what is this? Juvenile idiopathic arthritis um, is uh, arthritis in children less than 16 years of age. And um, we classify them into different subtypes um, based on ILAR classification system. There are several kinds, um, such as systemic um, GIA, polyarticular GIA, oligoarticular GIA. The ones shaded in yellow um, are the ones that sort of fall in the juvenile spondyloarthritis spectrum, specifically enthesitis-related arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, undifferentiated arthritis, and also perhaps reactive arthritis, arthritis associated with IBD as well. So if patients develop spondyloarthritis features before their 16th birthday, they're considered to have juvenile spondyloarthritis. 
and if they have spinal features before their 16th birthday, they're called, um, they're classified as having juvenile ankylosing spondylitis. So uh, this picture is another representation that shows that ankylosing spondylitis um, is one of the forms of spondyloarthritis, which is the most extreme form, uh, but you know, uh, patients can have any of these other uh, forms of spondyloarthritis. So also in children, they can have enthesitis related arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or undifferentiated arthritis. And um, juvenile ankylosing spondylitis is the extreme form and not all patients go on to develop this. Now, talking about the, um, the genetic heritability, like um, what is the risk, the genetic risk of someone developing um, spondyloarthritis? Um, HLA-B27 is one of the genes that we typically test for um, when we have a patient in the clinic with um, features uh, suggestive of spondyloarthritis. But it only accounts for 20% of the genetic heritability of this disease. There are several other mutations that um, researchers are um, now identifying that in total account for around 7 to 8% of the heritability. And hence, there's this huge green part of the pie, 72% of heritability of this disease that we just don't know. But we do know that HLA-B27 is an important risk factor in the sense the risk of developing ankylosing spondylitis is 10 to 20 times higher in patients with HLA-B27 and a family history of ankylosing spondylitis. A few words about juvenile psoriatic arthritis specifically. More than 50% of children with psoriasis with or without psoriatic arthritis have a family member affected with psoriasis. 50% increased risk of psoriatic arthritis is found in family members of adults with psoriatic arthritis. And the risk for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis is higher if the affected family members are on the paternal side of the family. So talking about um, the clinical presentation, like what kind of symptoms do children with uh, juvenile spondyloarthritis present with? They can have um, inflammation in their joints called um, arthritis. And uh, there are some joints that are more commonly involved with this disease process, like, for example, the hip joint, the knee joint, the foot, and the sacroiliac joints. And they can also have something called um, enthesitis, which is one of the characteristic features of spondyloarthritis. This um, is where there is inflammation at the sites where the tendons and ligaments get attached to the bone, like for example, around the kneecap um, or um, at the insertion of the heel cord to the um, sole of the foot. And in addition to involvement of the joints and enthesis, um, children can also have inflammation of their um, entire digits, which we call a sausage digit. And um, they can have uh, psoriatic skin patches if they have juvenile spondylo, um, sorry, juvenile psoriatic arthritis. If they carry the HLA-B27 gene, then they can develop episodes of eye inflammation, which we call acute anterior uveitis. And if they carry the ANA marker in their blood, um, they, they can also be at higher risk of developing um, what we call chronic idiopathic uveitis, which is again, an inflammatory condition of the eye. In addition, um, children can also have um, inflammation in their gut, um, which may or may not be symptomatic. And um, there are other organ systems that may also be involved, uh, more so in adults, but rarely can be seen in children, such as the heart, lungs, and the kidneys. Um, a few words about juvenile psoriatic arthritis uh, specifically. It presents in two flavors. Um, one group of children uh, with juvenile psoriatic arthritis tend to be really young in age. They tend to be uh, more um, girls and they tend to have the ANA marker in their blood. They can have inflammation of their digits, which we call um, dactylitis. And they may have involvement of many joints, which we call polyarticular involvement. In comparison, older children, typically teenagers, tend to have more enthesial inflammation or enthesitis. They have inflammation of the spine, which we call axial involvement. Um, it can affect both males and females equally, and they may not have the ANA marker in their blood. 
And another point to um, also keep in mind is um, the rheumatologist may give a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis based on several other markers. And you may question asking, my child does not even have a psoriatic skin patch. One thing to remember is that in children, the arthritis may come first and the psoriasis skin rash may lag behind by many years at times. Um, and the, this is how the sausage digit looks. Um, if you can pay attention to the second toe on the right, you see how the whole um, uh, toe is swollen. And um, if you take a look at the picture here, you see uh, the nail is not smooth. There are many dents or indentations, which we call pits. And this is something the rheumatology doctor will also pay attention to when you take your child for evaluation. So one um, a tip I would like to share is um, if your child is big on having their nails painted, please make sure those um, uh, you remove those um, nail painting when you take them to the rheumatologist because they do get a lot of information from looking at the nail bed. So what happens when um, you take your child um, to the rheumatologist for further evaluation? What are the kinds of things that they may do? In addition to a detailed physical examination, looking at their enthesial sites, their joints, their nails, um, the rheumatologist may order a battery of lab tests, one um, to check what their inflammation level is um, in the blood is. They may want to check if the child carries the HLA-B27 gene or the ANA marker. But one thing to remember is that the labs don't uh, make or break a diagnosis of arthritis. It's mostly based on clinical evaluation and um, with the, you know, sometimes with the help of imaging studies. So in terms of imaging studies, um, your rheumatologist may order x-rays of involved joints to see if there are any um, changes of joint damage already, for example, or um, they may also order um, a magnetic resonance uh, imaging or MRI uh, study to take a more deeper look at um, these joints. Like for example, um, if we are concerned for inflammation in the sacroiliac joints in the spine, we generally do get uh, an MRI of the sacroiliac joints to, um, to figure out what's going on because some of these deep seated joints um, uh, it's, it's hard to get a good assessment just on based on physical exam. The MRI study does not um, involve radiation, so um, it, it is safe to, to do. And the rheumatologist may also recommend that the child be seen by the ophthalmologist uh, to, to look for any signs of inflammation, either um, present inflammation or um, signs of uh, past inflammation in the eye. And um, they may refer uh, the child to uh, other specialists uh, based upon um, the clinical scenario. Like for example, um, if the child has significant limitation in the range of motion of a joint, um, in addition to targeting the inflammation with medications, um, we may recommend physical therapy for conditioning exercises and strengthening exercises. Um, and we may refer to other specialists like the dermatologist to manage the skin patch, the psoriatic skin patch, for example, or even gastroenterology if there is concern for um, gut inflammation. Now, there are some challenges um, that we um, come across uh, when we are diagnosing um, and managing children with juvenile spondyloarthritis. One of the challenges is diagnostic delay. Uh, the time to diagnose uh, diagnosis of juvenile spondyloarthritis is significantly longer in children uh, when you compare it to adults with ankylosing spondylitis. And there are several reasons for this. One um, reason is that um, several of the inflammation sites, uh, like I mentioned, called the enthesial sites, um, are also the sites of mechanical um, issues. So they may be initially diagnosed as having mechanical problems uh, managed with um, non-steroidals and um, physical therapy before um, someone uh, makes a call that th the child is complaining much more. There are many more sites involved. Perhaps this is um, something beyond mechanical issues. The other um, issue also that we deal with in children is that even when they have inflammation in the sacroiliac joints, which sits um, just above the, the buttocks, um, 
in adults, they may complain of low back pain, but children may not. In fact, there was one study uh, that specifically looked at um, MRI findings in children with um, enthesitis related arthritis. And there was a large percentage of children who had inflammation in the sacroiliac joints, but had no back pain. This is something we recognize in clinical practice. We call it silent sacroiliitis. So if there is um, any clinical concern, we have a low threshold to do an MRI to, uh, to figure out if there is inflammation going on there. Um, and there is also this uh, misconception that um, this is um, a male disease. Um, although um, the, the, one of the uh, points of the diagnostic uh, uh, classification criteria of juvenile um, um, idiopathic arthritis, specifically the enthesitis related arthritis, is that um, they get a point for each of those factors. And one of the points is that being a male over six years of age. So uh, you can imagine how um, uh, it's sort of um, subserving in, in a sense. So um, many females, when they complain of um, these sorts of um, aches and pains, um, that may not be the first thing that comes to mind uh, to your physician. So females do tend to have a longer um, uh, delay to diagnosis than, than fe uh, males for this particular condition. And uh, there's another aspect to juvenile spondyloarthritis. Um, studies looking at uh, children with uh, juvenile spondyloarthritis over time have noted that these children tend to have a huge component of chronic pain. And um, the number of um, enthesial uh, inflammation sites sort of um, also um, drives this in a sense. And um, there even when the arthritis is well controlled, these patients may still be um, having poor quality of life related to their pain. And um, majority of the patients uh, go on to um, have active disease um, in their adulthood. So the um, um, relative likelihood of disease remission is lower for this um, disease subtype. In terms of treatment, one of the first things that we try are uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, and there are several on the market. Um, and it's hard to tell which one your child will respond to. Uh, so the rheumatologist may have to cycle through a few before um, they, um, they figure out the one that works the best for your child. Um, Glucocorticoids may be used as um, what we call bridge therapy, meaning um, to... Um, when the symptoms are at its peak, we may start this medication for a short term while we wait for the other medications to sort of kick in. But um, we do not like to keep children on long-term um, corticosteroids because they have a lot of uh, side effects. And if there are a few joints involved, say for example, uh, the child only has um, knee joint inflammation, then um, in addition to starting a an, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, the rheumatologist may choose to inject steroids into the joint. That may help calm down the joint for um, several months to even years at some point. But if there is several joint involvement or um, enthesial involvement um, in many sites, then these medications may not be enough. And then um, in those scenarios, we move on to what is called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And there are several. Um, there's something called methotrexate, leflunamide, sulfasalazine. So the rheumatologist may discuss these treatment options with you. And um, in patients in whom these may not be sufficient, or say if they have involvement of the sacroiliac joints, then we do um, tend to move to these biologic disease-modifying drugs um, pretty quickly. And um, there are several of them, again. Uh, there are several um, TNF inhibitors or anti-TNF agents um, on the market. And these um, have been the most studied in spondyloarthritis, and they tend to work both, uh, well both for arthritis and enthesitis and also for eye inflammation. Um, 
our uh, armamentarium of medications to treat this condition is slowly uh, but surely expanding. Very recently, FDA approved uh, secukinumab for treatment for um, enthesitis-related arthritis and also psoriatic arthritis. And there are several other medications that we use in other forms of arthritis. And um, they're also used in adult um, spondyloarthritis that we sort of use um, uh, off-label, uh, but um, uh, we know that in clinical practice, they, they tend to help as well. And uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy are um, an, a necessary and important component of uh, treatment. They are as important as any of the other medications that the child is on, especially if they have a sacroiliac joint involvement, for example. Uh, it is of paramount importance for them to um, stretch their back and maintain that flexibility, um, and physical therapy plays a huge role in that. Um, several of these biologic medications are given in the form of subcutaneous shots, um, and there are some that are given as IV infusions. So this is going to be a big adjustment um, for when with a new diagnosis and with a new treatment for you and your child. So um, there are some tips and tricks um, that um, have been tried and tested by other um, parents um, that we would like to share um, thanks to the Arthritis Foundation. They've put together this nice list. Uh, one of the things that, um, that helps um, is relaxation and distraction. If you are stressed, the child is going to sense that and they're going to be stressed and it's not going to be a present experience. So try to relax yourself and um, try to distract the child. Um, this would not be the time to fight over uh, screen time. So uh, let them have all the screen time they want while you're trying to get the injection in. Numbing the area um, with eyes or sometimes uh, your rheumatologist could also prescribe a numbing cream, um, topical lidocaine cream, and that needs to be applied at least like 15-20 minutes before um, uh, giving the injection. And these subcutaneous shots are given um, either on the thigh or um, uh, arm or even the belly. Um, it really depends on what your preference is. And um, your rheumatologist may walk you through how to do the injection and they may do an injection with you um, in the office, but subsequent ones, um, you learn to do it at home. Another thing that tend to, tends to help is to, um, once you take the medication out of the refrigerator, um, um, while you're preparing to give the shot, let that be the first thing, like taking out the medication from the refrigerator so that while you're prepping the area, while you're numbing the area, the medication can come to room temperature and that tends to help um, sting less as well. And um, rotate the sides. So don't aim for the left thigh every time. So one week it could be the left thigh, another week it could be the right thigh or another week it could be the arm. And um, it, and one of the things that we struggle with in children is that they, they feel like they're losing control, right? So that could be one thing that you could give them a choice. Do you want your right thigh or the left thigh injection to, uh, injected today? So that gives them a sense of control uh, while um, they, they, um, they truly are lacking control in a lot of aspects of their life. And another thing that may help is massaging the area post-injection. Next, I'm gonna shift gears um, to uh, talk about um, role of diet in juvenile idiopathic arthritis. I'm using the terms juvenile idiopathic arthritis and juvenile spondyloarthritis interchangeably here, um, but um, please keep in mind that whatever I share for juvenile idiopathic arthritis or GIA applies for juvenile spondyloarthritis as well. Uh, there have been no controlled studies to evaluate the effects of uh, food in um, GIA. So is there a role for um, uh, a specific kind of diet and does that impact um, inflammation? So a diet high in carbohydrates um, has been shown to promote weight gain and increase inflammatory markers such as the CRP, IL-6, cholesterol, and triglyceride. A study of 21 overweight and obese young adults found that a low carbohydrate diet um, increased energy expenditure, decreased the C-reactive protein or CRP, and decreased their weight compared to uh, their pre-diet baseline. 
And another small study looking at 22 patients with JIA evaluated effects of specific carbohydrate diet over a four-week period, and they demonstrated significantly um, decreased stiffness in the morning, pain, and improvement in physical function. Um, in these children. And arthritis improved in five children uh, with um, demonstrable decrease in um, the inflammation markers uh, when they were checked in the blood. Foods that may help um, arthritis, um, some of them are things that are um, uh, rich in omega-3 uh, fatty acids, like for example, fish. So at least three to four ounces of fish twice a week. Um, is not a bad idea, if, uh, especially if your child likes to eat fish. There are several uh, fa- uh, types of fish that um, you could use. Extra virgin olive oil has heart-healthy fats, as well as um, oleocanthal, um, which has properties similar to that of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, there are several options there as well. Um, um, besides extra virgin olive oil, avocado and safflower, uh, safflower oil, and also walnut oil. Cherries and other berries are very good source of um, antioxidants called anthocyanins, and these have anti-inflammatory effect. Whole grains are um, known to reduce um, the inflammatory marker CRP in the blood. Good sources are oatmeal, brown rice, whole grain cereals, and also nuts. They are rich sources of protein, calcium, magnesium, zinc, vitamin E, and so on. Things that may hurt, food that may hurt, uh, things to avoid. One would be processed sugars because they are known to trigger um, inflammatory um, release of inflammatory messengers. So when you're looking at the food label, look for um, anything that uh, ends with the OSE, like fructose, sucrose, things like that. Saturated fats also trigger inflammation um, and they may worsen um, arthritis inflammation as well. Trans fat, like um, the the fast food and fried products, they are known to trigger systemic inflammation as well. Refined carbohydrates, such as wheat flour products, white rice, um, they may also um, um, worsen inflammation. And um, uh, A word about gluten and casein, Um, these are known to affect arthritis um, only in someone who has a known diagnosis of uh, celiac disease or gluten insensitivity. Next, focusing on exercise. There are no control studies to evaluate effects of exercise in um, GIA, but um, is it um, helpful and important to exercise um, when um, the child is suffering with GIA? Absolutely. Exercises that may help arthritis are um, swimming. Um, These are very low impact activities um, and um, yoga, tai chi, resistance training, stationary bike, and when they're able to even walking um, may be good options. And when is pain from exercise okay? If the child has mild pain or discomfort before exercise that gets better after a few minutes, I think it's okay to continue. You may need to monitor monitor or modify the exercise if there is moderate or severe pain in a specific area. Uh, You may uh, choose to focus on a different area for a day or two. If there is consistent joint pain after exercise, switch the activity. If there is occasional moderate or severe pain the day after activity, you may have to cut down on the intensity of the exercise. But if the child experiences moderate or severe joint pain during activity, then the rule of thumb is to stop immediately and seek for the guidance from your doctor. A couple word about transition. Like I mentioned, um, juvenile spondyloarthritis is a form of um, arthritis, which the which may not go into remission as the child goes into adulthood. So um, having um, a strategy in place to transition to an adult rheumatologist um, is very important. And um, our advice is to uh, talk frequently with your doctor about it and start early, at least a year, uh, if not more. Although I state here that the transition age is 17 to 20, um, some uh, advocates for a better transition would argue that you need to start this discussion when the child is as young as 14. With e- at, at each um, appointment with the doctor, um, give a little bit of the responsibility to the child. Let the child be the one answering the doctor's questions. 
and um, talk to the child about what they know about their disease and uh, why why they are taking certain medications, what those medications are for. And when they reach closer to the age of transition, also transition some of those responsibilities to them. Let they, they be the ones organizing their pill boxes every Sunday. Let they be the ones calling for refills to the pharmacy when they're running out of medication. Um, let they be the one um, trying to make an appointment with their doctor. You are going to be there by their side to troubleshoot, to support, but they need to start learning how to do these things on their own. Another thing um, to note is if they are um, on uh, subcutaneous medications, then um, when they feel comfortable, and this age can be different for different children, um, they can learn to self-administer the subcutaneous medications. And any medication changes or anything um, that the doctor suggests um, has to be a shared decision-making model between the doctor, the parents, and um, um, and the child. So with that, I want to leave you um, some um, links um, of um, organizations that are doing a ton of work um, in providing the education and also empowering uh, patients and families to uh, take charge of their health and be better advocates um, for, uh, for their health and managing their disease. Um, I have posted their links here. Please feel free to browse through them and uh, benefit from them. Thank you. I would like to welcome back our speakers, Wendy, Asad, Amina, and Dr. Srinivasalu, and also invite the audience to put their questions in the chat box. I can certainly kick things off. Um, I have a question for our patients. Uh, so some of our most effective and safe medications, unfortunately, come in the form of shots. And no one likes shots. It's especially difficult in children. Um, so when you were going through this, what did you do in terms of mindset or uh, physical things to make that an easier process? What kind of advice would you give families who are facing this type of therapy? Okay, so first off, um, so uh, when I first was going, when I first got diagnosed and I was about to um, go into and uh, administer the injection for the first time ever, so it's definitely a very uh, nerve wracking experience. I remember like it was my dad who was administering it and basically I was just crying and it took me, it took us over 40 minutes to actually administer the injection. And it is painful. Like it would, um, it felt like it was, um, it felt like it was burning in my leg and you had to keep the needle in for like 15 to 20 seconds. So the whole like concept of just keeping it in and like, having like a little needle in your body, like that whole experience is just really like, um, it made me really scared. Um, so, but then once like the first time we did it, then I just realized like, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. So we started, uh, as we started to do it every other week, it got better. Um, it was easier to do. Um, and now we also have the pen, which is just, you put it on your leg and you just press it and it automatically administers the injection. And that's like, uh, there's a lot less pain and a lot less work involved for the person who's doing it. So the pen really helped. But overall, once you start doing it a lot more, it actually becomes easier. I totally agree with that. The first time is really scary, but then when you get used to it more, and like Asad said, then you, you get used to it and it feels a bit better. And also what helped for me really is those screams that helps with the itching. So uh, that sometimes the, the the spot where you inject really hurts after a while. Um, so I would really recommend to talk about that if you have problems with that with your doctor. But what kind of creams were you? For the itching, like if it's really itching after the injections and you can put it on before and then sometimes it also hurts less. You have different types of creams. Okay. Uh, Amina, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure. Um, just with Asad, um, as we would, you know, I would help him every other week. Uh, I think icing also, I would just remind him to ice his leg uh, prior to administering that sort of just helped also 
uh, Nambi area. Um, and I would always just tell him, you know, take a deep breath and slowly, you know, initially we or my husband would help administer it. And then after that, we, when he switched over to the pen, he was administering it himself. But just take a deep breath, relax. And I think, um, you know, as he mentioned, as time went on, it just got easier um, because uh, he knew what to anticipate and it just psychologically it was easier as well. So there's a, a comment here um, from Rachel Zymont at the Spondylitis Association of America. Uh, thank you for sharing, Asad. And I'm sure Wendy and Amina as well. Um, all right, um, I can go back and forth. Uh, audience members, don't be shy. If you have any questions at all, we are totally at your disposal. Um, for uh, Dr. Srinivaslu, so this does run in families. And um, often as doctors, we see kids and come in um, who have uh, had an HLA B27 done because somebody in their family has this condition. Um, if the kid feels fine, the parents are going to be concerned. What do you tell them about their chances of actually developing the condition based on having a positive HLA B27? What does it mean or what does it not mean? Sure. Um, so HLA B27 is a gene um, which whose prevalence depends on um, the the uh, the race. Um, and there is a different uh, prevalence in different uh, populations. For example, in the Nordic population, we see very high prevalence of HLA B27 gene. And so also in Southeast Asia, for example, in Caucasians, um, general population, uh, the prevalence of this gene is around like eight to nine percent. So someone could have the HLA B27 gene and not have spondyloarthritis. Um, however, if there is a family history of spondyloarthritis and they also happen to carry the HLA-B27 gene, then uh, there is a higher risk of them developing inflammation in the um, uh, ax axial spine. So we do follow those patients more closely. And um, I would also like to reiterate that we can make a diagnosis of spondyloarthritis even in the absence of the HLA-B27 gene. Like I mentioned, a huge part of the heritability of this disease is still not known. So um, basing the diagnosis just based on the HLA-B27 uh, would be too naive, I would say. Okay, great. And that brings me up to a second kind of follow-up question. Um, if you, when you first go in to see the rheumatologist, if you don't have back involvement, can it change over time? And what, what, what do the, you need to be aware of looking into the future? Great. That's a great question. Thank you for that question. So um, the disease can evolve over time, especially in children. They can initially present with um, more uh, what we call peripheral arthritis, like, for example, arthritis in the knee or the hip or uh, the, the foot, what we call the tarsal joints. And uh, over time, there is a possibility that the patients could develop um, spine involvement. So uh, if they perceive any um, low back pain or stiffness in the morning or pain at night, definitely uh, do let your uh, doctors know about it. Um, and the doctors will also be checking uh, your child very carefully to look for any signs of um, inflammation in the sacroiliac joints. They'll do certain maneuvers. And if they have clinical suspicion, they would also uh, probably uh, recommend an MRI of the SI joints to look for inflammation. Um, and also one more thing to remember is that in, in children, they may or may not present with low back pain all the time. So um, the clinicians will have um, a higher um, index of suspicion and they would follow the patients more closely uh, so that uh, the inflammation in the back is not missed. Okay, yeah, added to that, uh, I've also had some patients who say that their hips are involved, but it's, it's really... Um, the low back. So sometimes yeah, it can be poorly That's That's a point well localized. made. Yeah. So when patients say hip pain, uh, we really ask like, where in the hip where? does it hurt? <laughs> um, and uh, sacral leg pain can be referred to the hip joint as well. So that's that's an important uh, word. Okay. Um, 
the audience is really shy or I'm just not getting these questions. Um, so I, I will plow on. I have uh, another question for our, our patients. Um, so when you go and you get this diagnosis, um, how do you cope or do you cope um, with receiving a, a diagnosis of a chronic arthritic condition? How, how did you process this and, and how did you adjust? Yeah, so well, big question, but go ahead. Yeah, so well, first off, like, um, so definitely it was like a big change in my life. I don't like, obviously we didn't expect it, but like, I think at first it was just like, oh, well, am I going to have to live with this disease uh, that my entire life, the rest of my life, taking medication and all of this stuff. And so that was pretty scary. But like, um, after a while, like the rheumatologists were definitely very helpful. They like broke everything down for me. They helped me understand. And like, now it's just very simple. Like, you know, I just take my anti-TNF agent every other week and also take methotrexate. And basically, it's very simple. Like, it's not something ongoing anymore. I barely noticed that I, I like, I have no pain anymore at all. So it's like, it's not like I, I can keep up with other kids, you know, it's not like I had to live the rest of my life basically like behind all the other kids because of the, of the, the, the disease. So, yeah. I'm always so happy to hear that story. I said, I think uh, for me, it's a bit of the same. You, it was already a while ago, of course, that I, I was diagnosed. And um, yeah, you get used to the idea and you get your things on how to cope with it. And then uh, over the years, I, I think you're really, like I saw the saying, it's really okay to deal with it, with things. Okay. Uh, Amina, did you want to add anything? You, know, how, you might have actually had more of an adjustment than your, your kid in, in some ways because uh, Saad was so young. Yeah, um, you know, it is obviously when he was, uh, when he was so young to be diagnosed, it was uh, daunting initially. However, when we realized there was a treatment plan and actually knowing, I think the hardest part was not knowing. So once we, you know, discovered what it was, it actually was, we felt some relief knowing that, okay, there's a certain protocol and there are options to treatment. So yes, it was, uh, you know, um, a lot initially to take in, um, but um, knowing that there's steps we can take and to help, you know, limit and control, uh, you know, his pain and make him more comfortable, just put it as put it as ease uh, overall. Okay. So there's another question from uh, the audience. Does season affect soreness of, or stiffness? Um, I guess we can hear from the uh, patients more directly about their experiences. Do you find that with, uh, you know, cold or damp that, that it affects how you feel? Well, for me, I didn't find like any correlation between the season or the type of weather um, to my pain at all. So uh, I think it, it depends on the person, but for me specifically, it wasn't, um, there was no correlation. Yeah, for me, neither. But I actually know that there are a lot of patients who are experiencing this. So I think it's just really a personal thing. But it, I think some patients really are experiencing the difference in seasons. Okay. Um, all right. This may be a little bit outside of the topic, but I know patients will um, come across it, especially with uh, today's treatment climate. Um, biosimilars. So, um, you know, patients may be prescribed a certain medication, but then their insurance company says, you're going to take this. For instance, my physician prescribed infliximab, but then when I went to the day treatment center, I got Inflectra or Renflexus. What's the deal here? Is it okay? Um, Dr. Shunivasalu. Might be a good educational point for people to say no. Thank you for that question. Um, so unfortunately, most of the treatment is mandated by what the insurance covers. And uh, 
for many insurances, uh, biosimilar will uh, is less expensive than um, uh, a biologic, uh, so to speak. And um, if the patient is being newly started on a biologic, um, and if the insurance says biosimilar is what they're going to cover, we oftentimes in clinical practice go ahead and start the biosimilar. Um, however, if the patient has been consistently um, uh, taking a biologic and has been responding to it, um, then there is a small chance that they could flare with the biosimilar, although not always. Uh, there, I have had uh, a number of patients who have had the switch from a biologic to, to a biosimilar and they have had continued response versus some who may not respond. So it really uh, is patient specific. There is no blanket statement that I can give, unfortunately. Um, however, in your particular case, if there has been a biologic that has been working and you have been switched to a biosimilar because of the insurance mandate and you feel personally that your disease is not well controlled, please bring it up to your physician. Maybe they can um, uh, do like a, a, a peer-to-peer review with their insurance company to reverse their decision. But biosimilars are here to stay is, is what I'm going to uh, say. And I'd also like to add that uh, physicians are your advocates, along with your, the parents of the patients. Okay. Um, any uh, last uh, parting bits of wisdom that you've gained this is, uh, for uh, Amina, Saad, and Wendy? You know, as, as we were talking through this, and and um, you're, you're hearing the various talks. Um, any last little bits of wisdom that you want to share with uh, the audience or insights that we didn't talk about in your pre-record that you, you just really feel like you want to share? Well, just the whole idea of like being diagnosed is very like, you know, frightening at first, but like, just with, like, just with the help of your doctors, you know, you'll, you'll be like, hey, okay, 100%. Like, so just like, um, don't give up, uh, stay positive, and yeah, you'll be just fine. Yeah. And I think what really helped for me was also getting in contact with other people that are experiencing the same thing. I think that really helped my experience, and I would really recommend that to anyone. Okay. Amina, any last bits um, to um, offer? Yep, uh, just uh, like everyone said, um, stay positive and um, you know follow your treatment plan whatever your doctor may everyone's journey is different everyone's struggles pains everything is different but I think if you um, go along with um, you know whatever your uh, physician has um, the treatment that they have uh, ordered for you um, you know hope for the best and 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 things there you know we uh, hope that um, everything will be okay And uh, Dr. Shuna Vaslu, any last parting thoughts? Sure. I, I would like to end by saying that um, this disease should not define you. You are so much more than this disease and you can be whatever that you want to be. Just look at Wendy. She's a PhD student and she's been able to navigate life and she's such a ray of hope to all patients and families. So please stay positive and uh, just take it in your stride. That seems to be a very good note to end on. So um, I'd, I'd like to uh, make a few announcements. So this material will be released in podcast form. Uh, there's a patient podcast that's going to be released July 19th and a clinician podcast uh, that will be released July 21st. We will also be having uh, more of these educational modules in uh, September. Uh, we will be focusing on pain and fatigue in spondyloarthritis and psoriatic arthritis. In October, uh, spondyloarthritis and uh, psoriatic arthritis treatment guidelines, so treatment updates. And then uh, we will be finishing the series in November uh, with a module on does changing behaviors help your arthritis? lifestyle, myths, and solutions. 
I'd like to thank Pfizer for making this all possible and thank our gracious speakers for their time. And then thank you all for attending today's program.